symposium on reading comprehension and large scale assessment. Uh, my name is Patrick Kelly. I'm the 12th grade teacher member of the National Assessment Governing Board. I'm a 16 year veteran educator and I currently teach AP US government to a group of seniors in Richland School District 2 in South Carolina. Um, while this session is designed to inform governing board members and their ongoing deliberations about revisions to the NAEP reading framework, the virtual environment allows us to engage many members of the public. In fact, we've got a, a, around 400 members of the public that have registered, so we're excited about this. And the board is thrilled for the opportunity for the public to engage in this conversation. However, due to time constraints, the Q&A sessions um, that we've built into the symposium will be restricted to participation by members of the governing board. Um, we are fortunate to be joined today by experts in international assessment, state assessment, alongside other large scale assessments here in the United States. We also have several reading scholars with us today and bios for our esteemed speakers have been shared with everyone. While NAEP is widely considered to be the gold standard in assessment and is the only source of both national and state by state student achievement trends in the United States, there's still much to be learned from other assessment programs, and we are grateful for this panel of experts that are participating today. We have three goals for today's session. They are to first surface different perspectives on how students bearing background knowledge is addressed in assessing reading comprehension. Second, to showcase examples of assessment strategies aligned to these perspectives. And third, to encourage discussion among panelists and board members about which examples are best suited to NAEP's legislative mandates and roles. So here's our plan for today. First, we'll hear from Dr. Daniel Willingham to describe the role of background knowledge in reading comprehension, and he'll reflect on what this might mean for assessment. Then I'll briefly describe where the board is in its current deliberations on revising the NAEP reading framework. We will also hear from reading scholar and NAEP reading framework update panelist, Gina Cervetti, who will describe how background knowledge is currently addressed in the NAEP reading framework or NAEP reading assessment. Then I'll invite a group of international assessment experts to describe how background knowledge is assessed in those assessments with some time reserved for board member Q&A. We'll follow the same pattern with a panel of experts of US national and state large scale assessments. And then we will bring Gina back to this um, discuss the implications of this afternoon's conversation for the NAEP reading framework update. And once Ms. Cervetti concludes, board members will have the opportunity to engage with all of our symposium panelists in a final round of questions and answers. Um, so with that groundwork um, laid, I'll remind board members that we are in open session, so please don't discuss any confidential details such as specific NAEP assessment items. And with that in mind, let's get started with remarks from Dr. Daniel Willingham. Um, so Dr. Willingham, I'd like to turn it over to you uh, to tell us about the role of importance of background knowledge in reading comprehension. Great, thank you so much. And, and thanks to all of you for uh, giving me a little bit of your time this afternoon. Uh, I wanna start by highlighting two families of studies that have been really important in uh, illustrating the connection between background knowledge and reading comprehension. The first family of studies uh, I'll call expertise studies. And in these studies, uh, we give a child a passage that would be typical of the sort of thing they would encounter in a reading comprehension test uh, in that the topic is just sort of randomly selected. It might be whales, it might be spiders, it might be the Appalachian Mountains. But then we also give them a passage that is meant to be comparable in difficulty, but is known to be on a topic that they have a lot of expertise on. So we know that this kid loves baseball, so we give them a baseball passage. Or we know they love dinosaurs, and we give them a dinosaur passage. And what we find very consistently is that kids are a whole lot better at comprehending text when it's on a topic that they know a whole lot about. Now, when you think about it, this might make us think about reading comprehension tests slightly differently because we normally think of comprehension tests as telling us not this is how good this child is at reading these particular passages, but instead this is how good a reader this child is, full stop. But the expertise study make us think twice about that, that their kid, the same kid is varying in how effectively they're reading depending on what they know about the topic. So another family of studies and the, the real landmark studies were conducted by Ann Cunningham and Keith Stanovich uh, close to the year 2000. Uh, examine the question, who is it who's doing really well on reading comprehension tests if this is right? And they reasoned, well, it would be 
people who have very broad knowledge, people who, no matter what the topic is of the passage on a comprehension test, they know at least a little something about that topic. So what Cunningham and Stanovich did was they gave very, very, a, a big battery actually of broad background knowledge tests. So they were testing knowledge of history and civics and arts and dance and so on. Um, and then they came up with a composite knowledge score. And then they looked at the correlation of that composite knowledge score and reading test scores. And they found that even when IQ is statistically controlled, you still get a very robust correlation between background knowledge and reading test scores. So next thing I wanna do is get a little bit more fine grained in particular and look at some studies indicating why it is this is happening, what's happening during the process of comprehension such that background knowledge is playing such an important role. Psycholinguists think about comprehension occurring at three levels. Um, I'm only gonna have time to talk about two, although knowledge is important at all three of the levels. Uh, we'll start with the simplest level um, that I'm going to talk about today, the level of the sentence. And so if I asked you, how do you extract meaning from these sentences such that you know that the man chased the dog means something different than the dog chased the man? If I pose that question to you, I'm sure you would say something like, well, I use the order of words and some other information um, to tell me what's the subject of the sentence, what's the direct object, blah, blah, blah. Basically, you're saying I'm, I'm using syntax. And that's, of course, correct. And it's, of course, necessary, but it's not really sufficient. And the reason it's not sufficient is many sentences are actually ambiguous. And what that means is if you apply the rules of syntax, there's more than one way to correctly apply the rules of syntax and come up with viable interpretations of the sentences that actually mean different things. In other words, lots of sentences are ambiguous. So if syntax leaves you with ambiguity, how do you resolve the ambiguity? Well, I'll give you a very simple example. Lynn scribbled on Brianna's picture. She ran to tell the teacher. So the second sentence is actually ambiguous because we don't know from syntax alone to whom she is supposed to be uh, referring here, whether it's Lynn or Brianna. But you're able to resolve the ambiguity with knowledge of the world, background knowledge. So you need to know that scribbling on someone's picture is sort of a misdemeanor. And you need to know that when a misdemeanor occurs, kids are likely to seek out an authority figure. And and especially you need to know that the person who's seeking out the authority figure is usually not the person who committed the crime, it's gonna be the victim of the crime. Now I wanna emphasize, psycholinguists would emphasize that many more sentences are ambiguous than you realize, syntactically ambiguous than you realize. And the reason you don't notice them is that background knowledge jumps in and resolves the ambiguity for you. Okay, so that's one level uh, of uh, comprehension, and we see how knowledge plays a role there. Let's look at the next level, which is making meaning across sentences. So have a look at these two sentences. Trisha spilled her coffee. Dan jumped up to get a rag. First thing to notice is if you simply understand the meaning of each of those sentences, you haven't gotten everything out of this brief text that the author probably intended. The author wants you to understand a causal connection between these sentences. Dan jumped up to get a rag because Trisha spilled her coffee. But again, notice there's a lot of knowledge you need to bring to this task in order to make that causal bridge. You need to know that spilled coffee makes a mess. You need to know that people don't like messes and you need to know that rags will clean a mess. Now the author omitted all that information. And this is very typical of communication. The reason authors and speakers uh, omit information is that if they didn't, Communication would be incredibly tedious. I mean, imagine someone, excuse me, imagine someone writing, Trisha spilled her coffee, Dan jumped up to get a rag. And, you know, by the way, rags are pretty good for cleaning messes and when Trisha spilled it and so forth. So your communicators, whether writers or speakers, they're constantly sort of judging what their audience is likely to know and gambling, I don't need to mention this. Uh, because that knowledge is already in their head. And the reason why authors are so confident in doing that is that people are really, really good at bringing that knowledge to the comprehension task and replacing the omitted information. So replacing omitted information 
when you're reading with information from memory is absolutely central to comprehension. This is something that we're doing all of the time. It's not sort of a peripheral factor that kind of influences comprehension. It is what comprehension is. The next thing I wanna get into is how exquisitely context sensitive your mind is and the way in which it's able to pull out exactly the right information. So go back to our example, Trisha spilled her coffee, Dan jumped up to get a rag. Suppose now that the second sentence had been, Dan jumped up to get her more. Now we see a different feature of spilling something becomes relevant. And I'm fairly confident that when you first read Dan jumped up to get a rag, you didn't think, okay, Dan jumped up to get a rag because there's a mess on the floor, he spilled it. But you know, it's also true that Trisha has less coffee than she had before. Right? You don't think about that. Your mind, even though you know that about spilling, your mind leaves that in the background and what it brings forward is only the sense of spilling that's correct for the context. Now we could keep going with this. We could say Dan jumped up howling in pain, a different feature of spilling, or Dan jumped up exclaiming, that's the last time I put brandy in your coffee. Again, a different feature of spilling. You know lots and lots of information about spilling. So how does the brain come up with the right interpretation. Well, the way the brain comes up with the right feature of spilling is based on the structure of knowledge. This is a really important point. It's not just that you need background knowledge. The background knowledge needs to be structured in the right, right way. The way you know that um, uh, uh, spilling, the, the feature of spilling that's relevant is that it makes a mess is when you see rag, rag, that concept is connected to things related to messes, right? That's a very simple version of what's going on here. So it's not just about having the knowledge in there. The knowledge needs to be connected and, uh, and structured to the right things and structured in the right way for you to be able to bring that knowledge uh, forward in, uh, in ex at exactly the right time and the right feature of it. So uh, I want to uh, use an example now uh, of why this is so important when we think about providing just-in-time information for students on a reading comprehension test. This is an example from the framework document we all got a few days ago. When Hannah Hashimoto announced that she had signed up for the talent show and that she'd be playing the violin, her brothers nearly fell out of her tree. Uh, and the suggested support was, well, if you don't know what a talent show is, there could be like a pop-up box providing a definition. A talent show is a show in which different people perform a special skill. And this feature of talent show is exactly the right feature for this context because the brothers are nearly falling out of the tree because they think Hannah's a terrible violinist. And so they can't believe that she's gonna play in public, that she's gonna make a performance. But suppose that talent show were used in a different context. At the big nightclub opening, the Hollywood agent was treated to talent show caliber performances. Now what might be relevant is that talent show performers are usually amateurs. And so the author is sort of making, taking a swipe at the uh, caliber of, uh, uh, of entertainment at this nightclub opening. Or suppose it was this sentence, I owed a lot of back rent, but I knew about a talent show I thought would be easy to win. Now what's relevant is that talent shows often offer a cash prize for the winner. So what I wanna highlight about providing just-in-time information is that in the Trisha Spilling example, we highlighted how you were able to use contextual information to pull up not just spill in general, but the right feature of spill. And it's this, the way your knowledge is structured is that what's doing that work for you. Uh, if we're going to provide just-in-time information for students in order to provide some support, that work is no longer going to be done by the reader. It's going to be done by the person who's writing the test. So in closing, let me say that I, 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 I definitely see the merit in trying to assess reading and reading alone and not having features that might affect reading but aren't really the core part of reading enter into the assessment. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear that the background knowledge component really is central to what reading is all about. Uh, and I think it would be a shame to try and take that out of the assessment because I think what would end up doing is fooling ourselves about how well some kids read and would, that would really do a disservice to them.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Willingham. And I already wrote down a ton of questions, but I don't even get to ask because I'm the moderator. So board members, at the end, we will have an opportunity for those questions. Um, if you want to go ahead and get in the queue and chat, that's fine. If you want to just keep a running tally, uh, but we'll cycle back and have an opportunity if you've got questions specific to Dr. Willingham a little later on. Um, and thank you for that presentation. Uh, with that important context on background knowledge, I want to briefly describe how this issue has emerged as a centerpiece as the board's discussion about the NAEP reading framework um, and, and its update. Uh, when the governing board conducted a review of this framework in 2018, several scholars and leaders indicated that NAEP should try to improve its approach to background knowledge in the reading assessment. In 2019, the board launched a project to update the NAEP reading framework. The current framework is adopted by the board in 2004. Uh, this was right before there was mandated state level, state level NAEP reporting every two years. I'd note it's also not a stretch to say the framework is well past due for an update, seeing as the last framework was written at a time when Blockbuster was the main way to watch a movie at home, Facebook and Twitter weren't household names, and the primary computing resources in the school were not found in the computer lab, or they were found in the computer lab instead of in students' pockets today with their smartphone. Uh, in the summer of 2020, a draft framework update was distributed for public comment. Uh, feedback was received from numerous members of the public and key educational stakeholders and groups, and there were also a few opinion pieces written on the proposed revision. Today, we're ready to discuss a revised draft of the reading framework um, update that has been informed by that public comment, as well as board deliberations at our last two quarterly meetings. Um, over 30 external stakeholders have been directly involved in the drafting effort for these framework update recommendations. And one of those individuals is reading scholar Gina Cervetti, who is joining us today. Uh, so Gina, can you describe how background knowledge is treated in the current reading assessment framework, the current reading assessment itself, and the updated recommendations that you've helped to develop? Gina, I'll turn it over to you. I can. <laughs> Okay. Can you see my, my slide? All right, terrific. Hi, I'm Gina Cervetti from the University of Michigan. I'm presenting today on behalf of the NAEP 2026 Framework Development Panel. As we begin to discuss how NAEP has addressed knowledge, it's important to note that there are many kinds of knowledge that play important roles in reading comprehension. But the role of topic knowledge or knowledge about the topic of a particular text being read is particularly well documented in a large body of research. Wide variations in students' knowledge result in reading comprehension performance scores that reflect not readers' comprehension ability, but instead differences in their knowledge about particular topics. A reader who happens to have knowledge related to the text presented in the assessment maybe because they live in a state where that topic is addressed in the content standards, or because they live in a region where that topic is part of their everyday experience, will be better able to use the processes described in the comprehension targets as they read and respond to questions. NAEP has long recognized that its estimates of reading comprehension are dependent on the relationship between students' topic knowledge and the passages they're given to read. The 2019 framework includes a description or a discussion, excuse me, of the role of background knowledge in reading. It notes that while there was no consensus about when and how to provide topic information, they had developed an approach that was informed by research and by the reading standing committee, which considered it important to provide introductions to texts in order to enhance the content and face validity of the assessment. The 2019 framework describes two strategies to address variation in background knowledge. The first is text selection. Designers were called to select passages that would span a diverse range of topics and areas, and also texts that were designed to be as engaging as possible to the full range of readers who would take the NAEP assessment. Designers were also called to choose texts that had sufficient elaboration of concepts that were likely to be new to students, particularly when they were selecting informational texts. The second approach was the inclusion of two support features, pop-up notes and introductions. There are other support features in the 2019 framework, but these are the two that specifically address background knowledge. 
pop-up notes are indicated by buttons in the text that signal to students that they can read more about a word or phrase. So in this case, that akçe is a unit of Turkish money. There are no assessment items directly related to the information provided in pop-up notes. Introductions supply information about a text to readers before they read. They are brief statements that include information about the author or context for the passage. So this is an example of a passage introduction from a previous NAEP reading assessment. The text introduces a Turkish folk, folk tale called Five Boiled Eggs. It explains that Nasreddin Hoca is a common figure in Turkish folk tales and that Hoca means teacher. In this second example, students are about to read a passage about women's suffrage. They're offered top, a topic related folk, um, or a topic focused introduction that says, quote, the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920 after decades of campaigning by the women's suffrage movement. All of the introductions in the 2019 framework or the, in the assessment are text, that is none include video or images or audio. And importantly, as with the pop-ups, the information provided is not tested in the comprehension items. So this slide represents the ways that knowledge is addressed in the two frameworks. Text selection considerations remain much the same. Pop-up notes that supply definitions for words or phrases also remain much the same. One shift is that the framework now refers to support features as knowledge UDEs or universal de design elements, bringing the NAEP design in line with research on universal design for assessment. The biggest updates are in the introductions, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these. So how has the approach to introductions been updated? Compared with the 2019 frameworks, framework, introductions based on the 2026 framework may be somewhat more elaborated and may use brief videos, images, or text to produce to, or to provide and introduce topical information that's necessary to understand the passage and may not be familiar to many students. So here's a fourth grade example. It's Hana Hashimoto's sixth violin again. Um, so this is from a literature, this is a literature example from the draft framework. It's important to note that we haven't actually asked permission to use this text as an example in the framework yet. So this is just an illustrative example. But in this book, a young girl named Hana signs up to play the violin in her school's talent show, having had only three violin lessons. At the outset of the, set, the assessment, test takers are invited to view a short video. This video introduces readers to the sounds of a violin and the fact that a violin is a stringed instrument that can be played as part of an orchestra. There's also a pop-up note on this page, on this first page of the story, that students can click on to the word talent show to access a brief explanation of what a talent show is. The information supplied in the UDs, that is the sound of the violin or the fact that a violin is a stringed instrument or can be played in an orchestra or the definition of talent show, none of that is assessed as part of the items. Instead, students are asked to draw inferences about the character from the event and descriptions in the story. So for example, after reading this story, the students are asked, quote, what kind of person is Hana? Name a character trait and explain why you think this describes Hana using an example from the story. So the rationale for the updates. Knowledge UDEs enable stakeholders to be more confident that the assessment scores reflect differences in comprehension ability rather than differences in topic knowledge, thereby increasing the validity of the interpretations from the test results. The NAEP reading assessment is not a test of curricular exposure to subject areas or a test of exposure to particular world experiences. I'm gonna say more about this in my discussion later today. Subject area knowledge and other kinds of topic knowledge is directly assessed in other NAEP assessments, NAEP science, civics, history, and so forth. Moreover, knowledge UDEs improve the assessment's ecological validity by reflecting the fact that in the world outside of standardized tests, readers rarely read text texts on entirely unfamiliar topics without any resources. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, so now we have an opportunity to learn a little bit from uh, other assessments and see how they handle this critically important topic as it relates to reading comprehension. Um, we're going to start out with the opportunity to learn from two international assessment leaders. Ina Mullis joins us from the Progress in International Reading Literacy Study, also commonly called PEARLS, 
And Andreas Schleicher is joining us from the Program for International Student Assessment, also called PISA. PEARLS and PISA are similar to NAEP in a couple of core ways. All three tests are administered to samples of students every few years, and these assessments do not produce individual student scores. Um, but to ground our conversation, Ina and Andreas, is there anything else that you'd like to highlight about how your assessment program is unique in the assessment landscape or how it is similar to NAEP that I haven't highlighted? Um, and for sake of ease on a video conference, so we're not all hitting on mute at the same time, Ina, let me ask you first, is there any similarity or difference between your assessment and NAEP that you would like to make sure everybody's aware of? I'll just do that during the presentation. Fantastic. Andreas? Yeah, you know, I also can keep my answer fairly short because actually PISA is remarkably similar to NAEP and that is because we learned a lot from NAEP when we actually constructed PISA. Obviously it's comparing nations, not states, even though many nations participate with individual states. The biggest difference doesn't actually lie in the assessment and its design, but in the fact that PISA collects a lot of contextual information from students, from teachers, from parents, from school leaders, uh, because our countries are very interested to see the context in which students learn, teachers teach, schools operate in. So and I think that's the biggest difference. And then in the assessment domains, uh, we have focused lately also on collaborative problem solving, social skills, on learning in the digital world is something we're working on global competencies. So there are some areas where there are differences, but when it comes to reading mathematics and science, that's very similar to me. All right, well, thank you. Um, so now I, I wanna take some time for us to really drill down on the issue of addressing background knowledge within a reading assessment. Um, and Ina, I'm gonna turn it over to you first. Can you share with us how background knowledge is handled in PEARLS? Yes, uh, thank you, Patrick. I will do that. Uh, Mick, Dr. Michael Martin is uh, executive director of PEARLS together with myself and we worked on this together. So uh, next. So what is PEARLS? It's a fourth grade assessment, which would be one difference with NAEP. It only assesses the fourth grade. And uh, as Andreas was saying, we work in a context of many, many countries. NAEP has had, well, go ahead, next. Now our view of reading is uh, described and you'll see here the fourth bullet, third bullet, is to use linguistic skills and comprehension strategies as well as background knowledge to construct meaning. That's been, so we understand completely that background knowledge is uh, part of reading comprehension. But in our context, we actually work through every phase of the assessment to reduce that impact. Next. So here is our, our framework. We have two purposes for reading, literary experience and acquiring new information and four processes of comprehension. Focus on retrieve information, make straightforward inferences, interpret and integrate ideas and information, and evaluate and critique content and textual elements. Next. Now, um, like NAEP, Pearls assesses student populations, not individual students. Second, we have a very large scope uh, in our assessment. We have 18 reading passages and five ePearls online informational tests that uh, simulate reading off the internet. These 23 passages and tests 
represent a wide range of content and settings with each student, one of 325,000, um, only giving two of these 23 passages. And it's all according to a complex rotated design. So our background knowledge is spread randomly over many passages and tasks and many, many students. Uh, next. Also, we uh, spend considerable effort to minimize the impact of background knowledge in selecting our passages. And we spend a, a year working with our countries uh, to choose the texts. And the texts themselves are provided by the countries and reviewed by the other participating countries to ensure that these passages reflect their students' authentic reading experiences. So any texts that depend on culture specific knowledge or any type of knowledge are usually automatically excluded. Next. The uh, we, one of the criteria is, is that they may introduce students to new information, but it must be presented in a way that can be easily understood by a reader unfamiliar with the topic. So we would not generally need to have pop-ups or something like that because those sorts of things aren't in the passages. Now, and we have iterative reviews, many reviews by countries experts to take into account fairness and sensitivity to students' backgrounds. Next. So in addition, in the passages, we are very clear that the items should be uh, not advantage or disadvantage students because of the items. And we try to do that by making sure that the items are all passage dependent. That means you should only be able to answer the question only by having read the text. There should not be any items where um, people can answer without having read the passage so that the items always are firmly grounded in the text. Uh, next. Now in, uh, we call um, that advantage that you're seeing from uh, background knowledge bias. So in writing items, we spend a lot of time and especially across all of the different cultures represented in our and experiences represented in the countries so that we are specifically looking for anything that would give an unfair advantage or disadvantage to students with some particular kinds of background. So nothing that could only be one nation, one culture, one ethnicity, one geographic location, and certainly nothing that would uh, be gender related in terms of context. So situations that uh, more girls participate in than boys are not there, nor are uh, passages with 
things, especially related to mail. So uh, next. Then we also continue as we go along in scoring, uh, we have half of our items are constructed response. So the scoring guides uh, need to be very careful. They meet very important aspects of our assessment. And they define the responses that are acceptable as evidence of reading comprehension in the way that there has to be evidence from the text that wouldn't just come up in students' daily lives or something specific to that passage. Each item has its own particular scoring guide. And then fair comparisons require that the assigned scores reflect the students' responses in accordance with the scoring guide. So there is no advantage to displaying extra background knowledge. All of the criteria for having an acceptable response as evidence of reading comprehension is to make sure that that evidence was in the text that they had to read and understand. Next. So, um, thank you. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to transition over to Andreas um, to tell us how PISA deals with background knowledge and reading assessment. And as Andreas is bringing up his slides, I just um, note for board members that after Andreas completes his presentation, we'll have a, a period of Q&A um, for our international assessment guests. Um, so if you're on the board and you've got questions, start dropping them into the chat box. So Andreas, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, I hope you can see my slides. First of all, for PISA, the advanced economies of the OECD that run PISA have adopted a contemporary definition of literacy that, as you can see here, extends beyond understanding text to embrace evaluation and reflection. And obviously that makes prior context, prior knowledge, a really difficult issue. Now you can see, for example, PISA puts a lot of emphasis on students' capacity to navigate ambiguity, to assess the quality and credibility of information. And when it comes to multiple texts, also to corroborate information, all things you need in the digital world. But as you can see, prior knowledge plays a really important role. Now, reading activity is obviously shaped by reader factors and prior knowledge is only one of them. We also need to think about motivation, other cognitive abilities, then we need to think about the task factors that, that motivate students' engagement with the text, uh, whether that's really for pleasure, you know, reading for deep understanding or just, you know, skimming text for information. And also we need to look at the text factors, uh, the format of the text, the complexity of the language that we use, the number of pieces of a text that we ask students to process in a digital world can be quite complex. So, the reading processes that students apply relate to both their own characteristics, but also their own perception of the text and also the task factors. Now, when it comes to prior knowledge, uh, lots of things can get into the way of measurement. First, prior knowledge can obviously influence students' motivation and engagement with the text, and that could be with the whole of PISA or just with a particular set of tasks. We need to watch out for that. It can help students or actually sometimes mislead them when answering literal or inferential comprehension task. And also it can provide a scaffold to students on which they can build their own mental representation. I think Dan has given us some really good example of this earlier. And in the extreme students could rely entirely on the prior knowledge rather than on what's in the text. So that's clearly a challenge for fairness, but there are also a number of advantages that an international assessment has over NAEP to get around those issues. First of all, with over 100 participating countries and systems, PISA provides an amazing laboratory of cultural context. We can compare and contrast how the same item functions in very, for students from very different contexts. Now, think about it like this, you know, for every 
language for every culture or ethnical group that you have in the United States, we have a whole country and we can test, design and evaluate each item specifically for that country, for that group. And that's a very powerful tool to keep the test fair or at least equally unfair uh, for each of the groups that we have, each of the student characteristics. That's a, one way of dealing with prior knowledge. We are also, and I think very similar to what Ina presented, using the diversity of social and cultural context among countries to minimize bias, to reduce the impact of prior knowledge. For example, the PISA tasks get, get sourced from all countries around the world uh, to avoid that you know, item developers might bring in their own biases in developing uh, tasks and blind it you know, by specific cultural perspectives. So in your case, imagine NAEP being developed in states and school districts all over the United States. And we hold item development workshops in the countries to ensure that the quality of that material is good. But that, that's a very important part for us to ensure that there is no systematic kind of advantage. And each country, like for uh, Pearls, undertakes an assessment of every item for its cultural appropriateness and also for its curricular relevance. That's obviously where prior knowledge often comes in. For student familiarity with the content, with the topic, with the context. And that's basically our proxy for prior knowledge at the aggregate level. And then we use psychometric analysis to identify item task interactions. I'm going to come to that in a moment. And another advantage is, like for NAEP, we are not looking at you know, individual scores, we're looking at aggregate scores. And that basically means the primary validity issue for PISA concerns population uh, level differences, not individual differences. If they're randomly distributed, we're less kind of concerned with this. And then like for NAEP, we use task rotation to dilute the kind of student interactions. So those are issues that are actually quite similar. But as you can see, the broader kind of context that we have in an international setting allows us to actually get a quite good handle on, on aspects of prior knowledge. Still, you know, item development is always a difficult balancing act. Now, on the one hand, we want to minimize bias by prior knowledge. So we obviously avoid context that influence you know, context or introduce bias, you know, we're not talking about history of food often, but, and I think that's very important. They, they are sort of, I sort of am not entirely in agreement with what Aina said. We are trying actually, we don't want to end up with a stale set of items that don't represent truly authentic reading experience and might disengage students. So for us, it's actually very important to have authentic reading tasks and acknowledging that, you know, prior knowledge is a factor that we need to deal with. Let me just show you one example um, <clears throat> where, where we actually intentionally chose an authentic topic where content matters. Now, this is our item, Rapa New York, Easter Island. And it's an example actually that incorporates, incorporates some of John Sabatini's ideas for scenario-based designs. Uh, we've learned a lot from that. Uh, as you have shown out earlier, we begin with an introduction that gives students important background. So students see all the facts about this island. We are also giving students a reason to engage with the proposed text. We find that very important. You see that here in the introduction. We use you know, pop-up notes, videos, animations, full elaboration of context. That's also important that we avoid that you know, there are terms that students might not be familiar with that we miss. But essentially, it's really about giving students a good introduction to this. And then, you know, the art of item writing is really to focus on those aspects of the text that do not require prior knowledge. Now, basically, you do not focus on specific aspects of the context, but the, the, the items get written in a way that actually they focus on those text elements where students cannot have prior knowledge, as far as that is possible, where they actually must read the text. That's really, I think, where item writing becomes very difficult. I'll show you in a moment how we actually test that. And then for questions that ask students to reflect on the form of a text, uh, we make sure that, you know, obviously those items do require prior knowledge of the form. That's what we'd want to test, but we do ensure that there are, is no prior knowledge on the facts required. So again, we diminish the impact of prior knowledge. Now, of course, the difficult question is, you know, how do we know? In order to address uh, any remaining concerns about you know, group level comparisons, then we use a model in which performance comparisons within country, so think again, you know, within each kind of group, 
are all based on every item, but then we link the national scales. So the scales between the groups that might operate differently to the international reporting scales based only on the items for which there is no item by country interaction, for which we can see stability across all social, cultural, linguistic groups. And that's the blue part here. So you can see actually for the vast majority of item country pairs, uh, there is no statistical evidence in support of item bias, including due to prior knowledge at the group level. Now, of course, this is after removing the items for which prior knowledge posed to be a problem in the earlier trials. And to be honest, you know, we started out with 346 reading items and we ended up with 173. So obviously in, this is a process where we have to be scrutinizing this, but the end result, as you can see, is actually quite stable. And we can be pretty sure that the sources of individual item bias are actually very, very limited. Andrea. Yeah, it's sort of, Oh, One really inter interesting exercise that we do at the end. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, what we do is we ask every education system. So think again about you know, each of your states, which of the tasks best match their curricular and cultural context? So on which they anticipate their own students to do best. And every country can basically choose its favorite set of items where they think this is what you know, matches our students' prior knowledge context best. And then we rescale the data for each country on their preferred items. And then we compare the scores on the preferred items with those from every other country. And here you can see just across the diagram, you can actually see it, the, the item choice does not significantly influence the rankings of countries. And that's giving us comfort that actually we're not leading to big distortions by the choice of items after all of the process that has been made. Now, one final step, there's one more important test that is uh, we use in PISA. We actually collect a lot of data from students on their prior knowledge of effective reading strategies, because we have data that show that the student knowledge about reading strategies actually is a big predictor of both their motivation and their performance. And in similar ways, we collect data on metacognition in reading. What do students know about reading practices? We collect data on their self-efficacy with different reading tasks and their student motivation. And we collect that data actually at the individual student level. So we can square that by you know, social background, cultural background, language, immigration status, and lots of other things. And actually, when you look at the results, you can see there is a relationship between you know, reading strategies and uh, reading performance and also self-efficacy and reading performance. And what we can now do is we can actually test how those relationships work out for different groups from different social and cultural backgrounds by gender, by country. So we can look at all of those interactions and that helps us both in the design stage where we have real problems, we eliminate items or we make them free. That was the great part, B. we exclude them from international anchoring. If we think sometimes these items are really, really important, we don't want to lose them but we acknowledge that they have you know, biases and therefore we keep them free in the kind of item set, but we can test those things. So wrapping up, uh, basically we start with a framework like NAEP that is agreed by all of the countries and that sort of guides the item developers, this tells the item developers actually what are the factors, the task factors, the individual factors and so on that should drive the item difficulty we then have all countries, all systems review each and every item for their exposure, familiarity, uh, student interest, cultural gender bias. Now that's a heavy process on every system. Think about you know, every state in your case, you know, going through this process, writing a report. And that means sometimes we'll have to drop items. Sometimes we have to drop them nationally only. Sometimes we have to drop them internationally. Now, and then we statistically at the end test to what extent, you know, culture, language, social background, prior knowledge, or, you know, metacognition reading strategies interact with each task. And uh, that's basically the process that we use in PISA. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And we've got about 10 minutes um, carved out right here for board Q&A. So I'm going to jump right into it. And board members, if we don't get to your question now, we've got a whole panel Q&A session at the end. So I will loop back to it. Um, but Frank, you were the first one up. So if you want to um, chime in with your question, please. 
Great, thank you. Um, and this question is for um, the Pearls folks and Ina, if you want to respond to this, just, you know, kind of what I was hearing was that context matters, um, but then you sort of talked about this concept and as I put it into the, uh, the, the chat box there, trying to select context neutral, I don't know if that's a term, context neutral types passages so that you don't need the, uh, the UDEs. And so if you could just elaborate a little bit on that, I think that would be helpful for me. Okay, thank you. And good, this gives me an uh, opportunity to also uh, address a uh, misconception that I might have had about our passages. Our passages are very rich and diverse in their context. But the two things that I think happen is even though they're very interesting, some passages can have more requirements for prior knowledge. So we try the best we can to have ones that the students don't need prior knowledge. The information is put straightforwardly in the passage. And if they can read that text, they will be able to answer all the questions that we ask them from only that text. And there's checks about that all along the way. And so sometimes, you know, it's new and they're interesting. We have whole varieties, you know, uh, Brad Spent sent uh, Marie Curie and Norway sent the Kongtiki and didn't get to have it because there were no men, I mean, no women on <laughs> Kongtiki and on and on it goes, you know, one country sends it in, the other countries throw it out. One country sends it in. So we do that over and over and over until, you know, it, they're all interesting and nice, but uh, not going to favor anybody really. So. Yeah, could I, <clears throat> could I add, Ina? Yeah, add on. Yeah, add on. I was thinking about what Dan was calling background knowledge. No, we wouldn't really call that background knowledge. I mean, 10 year old students know what coffee is. They know what if you spill it, it makes a mess. There's a vast amount of you know, shared everyday knowledge that you can rely on the students having. The background knowledge we try to control for is much more deep knowledge and you know, detailed knowledge of particular events or characteristics. So we don't, we don't really take all that stuff out. It's, we just take the egregious differences out of the passages. All right, thanks. Greg, you are next up <clears throat> followed by Governor Geringer. Yeah, thanks. Even though my uh, comments will sound like I'm trying to summarize um, uh, other people's uh, questions and perspectives in the board, it's only mine. Um, I, I, my, I get a sense that there's pretty broad consensus that, you know, no, nobody argues with the idea that background knowledge uh, it comes into play every time we read anything. I mean, that, that's sort of a given. And I think we all really have a lot of respect for what NCS does in terms of procedures and things to, um, you know, help uh, eliminate some of the some of those kinds of problems. I guess um, sort of to, to let panel members in, you know, on the inside of it, I think there is some question, at least that we're wrestling with now is, to what extent is it really a good idea um, to control for background knowledge? To what extent does that uh, uh, serve students well? You know, if I get a passage that says violin in it, and I don't know what it is, self-regulation kicks in, and um, I go and I find it, you know, it's not pushed to me in a way. Um, that's a reading skill I have to learn. I'm, I don't think I oppose that at all. Um, but so my question for the, the panel is, uh, most of you, all of you, I think have generally spoken in favor uh, of this. What concerns do you have about um, uh, greater in incorporation of background knowledge and ape assessments? What are the dangers? What concerns do you have? Say, I think that that idea, I, I, I agree with what you just said, Greg, that that idea of spoon feeding things along while you're reading is not authentic reading. And I think it could be, I think, distracting and could have an adverse effect 
on comprehension achievement. I don't know, has the board studied that to see? Yeah, you know, Craig, I actually think, you know, uh, elimination of background knowledge cannot be the objective because you end up with texts that are not authentic. I think the goal needs to be to control it in the way that we can measure its impact and we can measure its impact differentially based on, you know, where it comes from. And uh, is it, you know, access to reading strategies? Is it content knowledge? Is it, you know, uh, social background and so on? I think that's really what uh, we're, we're trying to do. But I uh, and to give young people, I think the the fact that you know, both NAEP and PISA have now moved fully digital, it gives us the tools actually to, you know, give young people the tools to actually find the knowledge that they need through, you know, uh, links and pop-up windows. You know, in a way, if you can read, but you're not able to, 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 to find, you know, background knowledge, uh, you're not a great reader in the digital kind of world. And so I think we now have the means to, 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 to manage that process rather than to create tasks that are completely neutral of background knowledge. No? All right, we'll transition to Governor Geringer, and then after that, Paul is up. I'm not even sure how to ask the question, so maybe I don't have one. Uh, to me, background knowledge is important. I was trying to differentiate between assimilation and comprehension, thinking that comprehension follows assimilation, but I don't know how the testing experts view that if there is a differentiation in those words. So. Uh, maybe the context I would put it in, as we're talking about reading and reading comprehension, I thought, well, how do we approach this in other testing? Uh, math testing depends on background knowledge, and that background knowledge was, what were you taught before? Uh, same way with physics, or my background in engineering, a lot of what I do for problem solving depends on what prior academic and practical experience I've had. So it, it keeps going back to, uh, for what I'm trying to measure in terms of current comprehension, the human mind depends on assimilation. Is there, is there any other way to, to explain it? I, I see the impact of background knowledge, but somehow we're trying to sift out any advantage someone might have by having broader experience, more exposure, or other background that would lend to the ability for a student to assimilate and therefore demonstrate comprehension. So I don't even know if I have a question. You have a point of view, and it, <laughs> good. Governor, I, I would also sort of, uh, I, I see your point. At the same time, I think you would have to ensure in an assessment, and that's a difficult challenge, to, that the assessment when it comes to uh, knowledge is equally unfair to all students. If you give you know, tasks which actually favor students living in a specific geographic area or in a specific cultural context, then I think you have a problem. And that's really how PISA approaches this problem. We look at this test, how it operates in different kinds of groups and compare those interactions. And uh, if we find you know, through, uh, that, that the test is equally unfair to, to students when it comes to content knowledge, we have no problem with the content knowledge. We think actually it's it's an important factor, but I think that the problem enters into the equation when we actually favor or disfavor uh, specific groups. <clears throat> All right, we have time for one last question before we move to our next group of panelists. So Paul, go ahead and everyone else that was in the queue, we'll loop back at the end when we have all panelists available. Patrick, I'll defer to the next person. I was, uh, I was my question was similar to the governor, trying to understand similar to the governor's. All right, then Marty. Great, I'll be brief so we can get on to the rest of the presentation. I really, I guess, wanted to uh, invite Dan to react to the presentations that followed his, um, because if I'm not mistaken, I, I think we did hear a pretty fundamental difference where Dan really characterized background knowledge as, if not the essence of, essential to reading comprehension. And I heard Ina refer to that as uh, bias. And Dan, um, I'm sure you would agree though with what Andreas just said that uh, we do wanna find a way to, um, uh, I guess, uh, be equally unfair to all students to, to uh, rule out of reading comprehension tests uh, differences in measured achievement that uh, are going to naturally emerge from students' life experiences by virtue of say where they live and the weather they experience and the like. So can you help us 
sort of, uh, is it possible to draw a line between doing what Andreas uh, suggested and, and sort of ruling out uh, background knowledge from the construct uh, at all, which I don't think we want to do? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Marty, because I think you, you've identified exactly where the friction lies. Um, I, the, I think the key difference between uh, what I was saying and the presentations I heard after me was uh, what I'm saying is background knowledge is not just sort of a problem that we need to solve in terms of fairness. It is what reading is and, and a couple, or part of what reading is. And in a couple of um, the presentations, I heard sort of the, the emphasis on what we really want to measure is comprehension as if that's completely independent of knowledge. And that's not a good way to think about it. It's similar to, you see this throughout cognitive processes. If you talk about someone thinking scientifically, they can think scientifically about scientific topics they know something about. You can be a very good scientific thinker in psychology, for example, and, not, and be totally lost when you try and read something in chemistry. And the same thing is true throughout cognitive processes, including reading comprehension. So the, the idea of sort of um, managing the fairness problem is obviously central, um, but you should keep in mind what it is you're trying to measure and not thinking that, you know, what, what, the real, the, what we really want to do is measure the core aspect of reading, which is comprehension. And then there's background knowledge, which is kind of getting in the way and needs to be managed. It's part of the construct. Thank you. All right. Which... I think will lead well into our next segment. And then we can loop back to this again at the end, obviously. Um, so next up, we're joined by several experts from some large scale US assessment programs. Um, and to, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just kind of dive right in on those. Um, and for the panelists, uh, if you want to delineate between your assessment and uh, NAEP in any way, uh, that, that's perfectly fine in your presentation. I'll just note that while NAEP doesn't produce individual student scores, um, these are all three assessments that do. Um, so I want to start by going to um, Jenna Chasson from the Louisiana Department of Education, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about assessment in her world. So Jenna, go ahead and take it away, please. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here with you all and share some of the approach and some of the work that we are doing here in Louisiana in our what we are calling our innovative assessment pilot. And so here in our state, we have done work in the last several years to create an instructional materials review process. And in using this process, we've made it easier for our school systems in our state to adopt high quality instructional materials. We've also developed guidebooks and English language arts curriculum that is available for free nationally on the LearnZillion platform. And this is a, um, a place to start in today's conversation around our innovative assessment pilot because it is really unique to our state that we have about 75% of our school systems using this one ELA curriculum guidebooks. And so this provides a really unique opportunity for us here to connect curriculum and assessment. And so our innovative assessment pilot takes an approach um, through integration. So through several brief assessments, including both ELA and social studies content, because social studies content is baked into our guidebooks curriculum. So these assessments are administered throughout the year rather than just one end of year ELA test. And this assessment is a reading and writing assessment that is sequenced with knowledge rich curriculum to measure students ability to understand and build knowledge from reading and then express that knowledge and understanding in writing. We are really encouraged by some of our initial data that we are seeing so far in this innovative assessment pilot we're seeing that students are more engaged in this assessment. We can see this both um, anecdotally and qualitatively, but we can also see it um, at the amount of time that students are spending on each particular item that we're able to track. So they're spending more time with individual items, showing a higher level of engagement. We're also seeing some early data 
that students in historically disadvantaged groups are performing better on these assessments than on our traditional state level assessments. And so this data is very initial and early and we're, we're looking forward to a complete year of data collection in that approach. And so you can see there that integration, focus, equity, and also preserving some local control. So our school systems still are continuing to decide which books are used during instruction and which assessment students take. And so this I think is the best comparison about our current approach in our state level assessment and the difference here that we have in our innovative assessment pilot. So our current state level test, what we call our LEAP 2025 test, has cold read text, which is a random selection of grade level texts that are purposely unrelated to anything that students have studied in that grade level. So it is meant to be a cold read, a text that students are seeing for the very first time. And in the innovative assessment pilot, we use a combination of hot read text and warm read text. And those hot read texts are actual passages and texts that students have studied in their English language arts class. So they have already seen these texts, they are already familiar with them, as well as the use of warm read texts. So these are texts that students have not read in class, they have not already engaged with these texts, but they are topically related to the information and the knowledge that, have, that they have encountered in their coursework. And so although they are not the exact same text, they still are bringing a level of background knowledge to the table when they read these warm read texts. The other difference in the approach of the innovative assessment from our current state level test and, and many states state level exams is that these are given throughout the year. And so with two components, and those are end of unit assessments and an end of year essay. And so at the end of each unit, students are engaging with an end of unit assessment and that happens in the fall, early winter and spring and culminates with an end of year essay that synthesizes their learning. This is an example of an end of year essay prompt that we wanted to share with you all today. The end of your essay consists of a single essay question that requires students to use and extend the knowledge built through the text they have read throughout the year in their English language arts class. Students have the opportunity to show that they can both synthesize knowledge across multiple texts in order to address a global concept. And so you see here the essay question is for the end of your essay, you will answer one essay question, read carefully. Then think about the many texts you have read and topics you have studied throughout the year in your English language arts class. Write a well-developed essay based on the knowledge you built from the text and units of study. So it is encouraging students to think about all that they have read and all the background knowledge they have acquired together as a class um, through their course. And then they would answer the following prompt. In your ELA class this year, you have studied texts in which individuals have found themselves in seemingly hopeless situations. Write a well-constructed essay explaining how the following statement could apply to the individuals in those texts. And they would then see a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. And so the students would be required to develop an essay using the background knowledge that they have gained in class and tying together the multiple pieces of text that they have read throughout the year in relationship to this quote. In closing, we are really enthused by some of the early data that we're seeing around this pilot assessment. Um, we do not have a full year of data yet at this point, so we are really looking forward to that. Obviously still early on in the piloting phase, but we're hopeful um, about the future of this innovative assessment. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jenna. And um, board members, we're going to have an opportunity for question and answer after two more presenters. So if you want have any questions specific to Jenna, you can start putting those in the queue. Um, but next up, we're going to hear from Rachel Kashaf, who is going from Smarter Balance Consortium. And she's going to tell us how Smarter Balance takes an approach to assessment and reading and background knowledge. 
Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to come and share a little bit of information about Smarter Balanced and our process. Slides showing up okay? Great. So we don't have time to get into a lot about how we organize the standards into what we call claims and targets, but we did want to acknowledge that we have available public information uh, that you can access if you're interested in more of that about um, our specific uh, information to the claim one reading on our assessment. I'm going to spend the majority of our time talking about our process to select passages that we include in the assessment and then the items that we write associated associated to those passages that we uh, call stimulus sets when they're joined together. And the main theme running through the presentation will be how we leverage educator expertise and judgment throughout the process to both select the passages and write the items. Um, and that of course is embedded within a process of training, ongoing monitoring and bringing in multidisciplinary perspectives to each of the activities. So a note on our educator involvement, we um, hold several events throughout the year with educators. We require that educators have a recent K-12 experience in the classroom, so within the last three years. Uh, we also request and require that they have familiarity with the Common Core State Standards, which is what we assess on our assessment. And we're very purposeful in seeking out educators who have a variety of different expertise and backgrounds and also who work with students from uh, different backgrounds and different needs in the classroom. So we uh, work to include educators who have uh, certification and experience with uh, English learner education, special education, among the many other um, expertise they bring to the table. We also, like NAEP, have representation across the country, and so we are proactively seeking out educators from across um, the, the country, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, and islands um, to participate in the uh, activities with our educators. So for passage selection, we select passages that are already existing. We work with educators to identify and approve passages that are aligned to the standards, um, that adhere to our bias and sensitivity guidelines, and adhere to some different complex, uh, language complexity measures. So as an example, we uh, go through a process to create a, what we call a placemat with educators during the educator committee reviews. Um, the educators come together and they work in groups of about four to six, and they review uh, passages that are candidate passages for use on the assessment, and they evaluate the passages for a variety of different uh, characteristics. Um, there's some quantitative measures in the placemat, but there's also some qualitative measures, and that's where we really rely on educator judgment uh, to make sure that the passages are appropriate for the grade level and include the right amount of uh, contextual information and supporting details as necessary. So you can see in the qualitative measures, we explicitly request that educators review and evaluate the passages for knowledge demands specific to their lived experiences, as well as the cultural knowledge and or um, reference to cultural activities, cultural practices that may be present in a given passage. So I have a screenshot here, not intending to show uh, and talk through all of the text, but just to give you an idea in the placemat, we have a spectrum here from from slightly complex to exceedingly complex and educators are evaluating the passages um, in this case specifically for the life experiences being described or requiring that um, the, the knowledge of in terms of understanding the passage as well as any references to cultural practices cultural events and, and other information in the context um, passages that fall into that exceedingly complex evaluation by the educators are, are rejected and they do not move forward um, passages that are identified as uh, moderately complex or very complex may move forward but it depends on that holistic, holistic evaluation of the passage itself. Uh, again, not intending to get into a lot of information about our item development process, but once educators have approved passages for use on the assessment, we then work to develop items or test questions associated to those passages. And we have a very uh, kind of robust and iterative yet linear process to develop those items and test questions. And today we just wanted to highlight a couple of elements uh, for you all in that item development process. Again, going back to the kind of beginning of the presentation, we really ground our work and have since the inception in evidence-centered design, making sure that the content is upfront in terms of what it is we're intending to measure in the assessment. Uh, we also provide training for item authors on accessibility, bias, and sensitivity upfront um, so that they have that information and training available as they write items. 
We work with both professional item writers as well as educators to develop items that go on in, for inclusion in the operational test. Um, as the authors draft the items, um, there are some iterative reviews by staff. Again, we have staff with uh, content expertise, but also expertise in accessibility bias and sensitivity to make sure the examples and the context that's being uh, drawn upon is appropriate for the grade level and also for the context of the assessment. Before any item goes forward to field test, it must be approved by a second educator committee. Uh, again, educators come together and work in groups of four to six to evaluate the test questions that have been written associated to the passage. Um, and they're evaluating the items for uh, clarity. Again, kind of thinking back to Dan, some of your examples, um, whether or not there's figurative language, is that part of what's being assessed? If not, is it used appropriately? Is it within the grade level expectation of what we would uh, expect students to have familiarity with? And really helping us make sure that those items are um, fine-tuned and clear and could be understood by students from across the consortium. And then finally, uh, if items require a data review because they've been flagged for things like diff, or if there's some uh, distractors that are more attractive to students based on the performance data than we would have expected, we bring educator, uh, educator committee back again and ask them to review the items a second time, this time with the student performance data and ask them to approve or reject the items uh, for use on the operational test. And so again, a note on our training uh, for item development, uh, uh, we do have bias and sensitivity guidelines. Uh, those are publicly available and can be accessed if you're looking to dive into a lot of the details, but we really try to ground and center the, um, uh, the development of our items in kind of the fairness of content and the fairness of context. So again, once the passages have been selected, working to make sure the items are appropriate for the grade level, that they resonate with students and educators really help us uh, drive those decisions and approvals. Um, in terms of fairness of context, we really center on those contexts that would have been uh, familiar to students via their participation in school. So I may not live near the ocean, I may not have experience playing outside of the snow, but we would expect uh, students to be familiar with both of those contexts um, based on their experiences in school. We work with educators to make that determination, again, making sure that they're driving the decision of whether the balance is appropriate in terms of the level of detail. Any level of detail about a lived experience should be something they could see through. We use a, a window and mirror approach. You can see the, into those details as part of the passage, and then you can reflect them back um, and sort of uh, see them back as you're reading through the passage. Of course, avoiding any uh, irrelevant knowledge, uh, something that would be overly technical, specific to an occupation, specific to a region as well. And then a final note on some additional supports. Again, uh, uh, when we're thinking about how we support students with different lived experiences, uh, we can add footnotes to the passage that is often done as part of the passage selection up front when we're working with educators to, to kind of ground some of the references or terms that are used in the passage. Uh, they can also be added as we work with educators to review and vet the items and, and how that draws upon the information in a passage. We also have, uh, similar to some of the other presentations, uh, in some cases we may orient the reader to an excerpt of a larger passage set or a, a larger source, excuse me, and so to kind of give them a, a step into the passage and, and a, a kind of um, a little bit of an introduction into what they're about to read, we may add in a context setting statement. And then finally, um, although used sparingly because of the construct we're often intending to measure for our claim one reading items, we do embed English glossaries into those items as appropriate, again, to scaffold uh, uh, the, the, the understanding of specific terms in the items, um, whether those um, items are supported by a specific definition or a synonym in the embedded glossary. And so that wraps up the information I have. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And we've got one more um, national testing expert that we're going to turn to before a, a Q&A session. Um, John Sabatini is from the University of Memphis, and he's here today representing the Global Integrated Scenario-Based Assessments, or GISA. Um, so John, I'll turn it over to you. John, you may still be on mute. There we go. Am I, you can hear me now. We can hear you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this. I have learned so much already today. Like everyone else, I have way too much information on my slides, so I will talk over them, not through every single word on them. Uh, 
I differ from some of the others in that the Giza was uh, basically its origin story is a large federal grant, uh, uh, part of a large initiative by the IES, which had both teams that developed instruction and assessment. And at ETS at the time, I led the uh, assessment project, which had as its goal to develop a comprehension framework spanning uh, pre-K through 12th grade that was theory driven and sensitive to development. Uh, we were to map uh, reading learning science onto the test designs and develop summative assessments. So we did four, eight and 12 and everything in between and evaluate the, the uh, uh, feasibility and psychometric quality of those. So of course, like all good research teams, we reviewed everything we could about the literature. We reviewed the other assessment consortia across the time and how they were developing things. And we drew the, what we thought was obvious conclusion that uh, some of the necessary construct needed to change to meet the demands of the 21st century. So uh, this is my one slide to illustrate the, the changes that we felt we had to address. Um, in 1997, when I actually started in education and assessment, there were about 1.1 million websites. Since then, this is the definition of exponential growth. There's 120 million 10 years later, 1.26 billion 10 years later, and it's just growing unbelievably. So if you have uh, this kind of change in the world construct of reading and literacy, you're gonna have a change in the cognitive skills required to uh, read, understand, and apply knowledge to those. And therefore your theory and your science is going to actually have to uh, adapt itself to, to this changing uh, context. So we managed to simplify it in our documents to uh, this particular five elements of reading. And I think knowledge most impacts these three here. Uh, this slide is just to show you that we did have more depth in when, when we write these into documents, but we largely see what we did as compatible with both PISA and NAEP. Uh, the, the name Giza, that we, the way we pronounce it is not completely accidental. We, we had Pisa on our minds at the time, and we're glad to have had some opportunity to participate in that. And our team goes back studying the problem of the relationship of knowledge to reading comprehension over 10 years. And I want to acknowledge my uh, co-PI on all of this, Taneo O'Reilly, who's still at uh, ETS, and a lot of the seminal work he's done there including um, recent knowledge grant that we, that we had to look at specifically at this issue, as well as the incorporation of some of our scenario work and others into some of the assessment pro programs we've heard today, including PISA and NAEP. Um, we give a very basic definition of scenario-based assessment as a technique actually to deliver a set of sequence and thematically related materials, where you get a collection of materials that are actually related to the purpose that's driving your reading problem and then you use that to basically solve problems with the text. So it's a very applied model. So to give the one example that we're gonna use, cause I wanna to turn to knowledge next, a scenario could have been a high school group uh, studying for an upcoming exam. This is an example. Uh, the classmates decide to form a study group. That means they're responsible for helping each other. And what's the first thing you do in such a group? You find out what you already know about the topic. So this gives us a sort of excuse to actually look into their background knowledge. Now, background knowledge is, as and I think uh, Andreas mentioned, one of several interacting sort of moderators to what we mean by reading. And so we're gonna focus on it here, but maybe later in our discussions, we can talk about how some of these other things interact with it because uh, they came up in other discussions. So um, basically, our positions would be there's no way to guarantee everyone does have the same background knowledge. And thank you very much, Dr. Willingham, for your explanation of the, the sort of subtlety with which background knowledge interacts with every inference one makes about the meaning of text. By the way, when I mentioned social model, part of that was what you described. That is the understanding of the intents of people as it interacts with the text content. So if you need to know that you need to uh, clean up the spill, that's a social model that doesn't depend on reading, but it depends on your understanding of the world. Okay, so uh, adequate background knowledge is very important for higher order comprehension because in order to reason about something, you have to know something about it. So if you're building your knowledge, it's harder for us to do the more complex reasoning and evaluation that we wanna see you do once you have that knowledge. 
And we've actually have studies that show that if you absolutely have the baseline, no knowledge about something, building those basic inferences that built up a mental model of the text become almost so effortful to do. And remember, these are time-based assessments. So you have to be able to do this in real time. And we were always sensitive to that. How much can you do in the real time you're provided, given a text to read and build up these answers to questions and models? And this is why it becomes an issue of fairness. So to give one example from recent work we did where we picked a topic, as you mentioned in these expert studies, that wasn't completely confounded with academic knowledge. By the way, we simultaneously were doing history and science at the same time. We also said football. And the scenario was that there's an international exchange student. And so they're sitting there comparing and contrasting the rules and the, the processes and the vocabulary of foot, American football and international football like soccer. And of course, as you can see, even the basic terminology, it's shared across the two, but it means very different things as uh, you know, very different nuance. Field goal in American football is worth three points. Kicking a goal in, in, off of the field is one point in soccer. So we use two interesting, quick, easy techniques, easy in the sense of uh, easy for the students to do. So remember our scenario, you have to study things. So since we're gonna deal with a topic and topical knowledge, we use natural language processing techniques to identify topical knowledge related to this and topical vocabulary. We gave the, the, the engaging simple task of students basically uh, deciding, does this word fit in the topic or not fit in the topic? And then we immediately gave them feedback on it. So we weren't testing their knowledge, although we got knowledge, information of their knowledge, but we were able to actually uh, basically uh, activate their prior knowledge to give them a little bit of resource on what kind of things might be involved in the topic. Another technique we used right off the bat was we took release NAEP items from science and history and embedded them as our free kind of know, you know, background knowledge. Hey, do you know about this? Here's some questions. Uh, in this case, we didn't actually give them the answers. We basically gave them topical content that was around a problem of invasive species where this was relevant to what they were doing. And then based on the information we gave them, they would be able to answer these kinds of questions by the end of it. And then we did check to see if they could in fact answer. Them. But again, we made it very clear to them that this was sort of the study part of this, not the testing part of this. And tried to reinforce that point with our icons or avatars as they call them here. Um, and again, with, in, in, in sort of endorsement of the techniques I've heard about how NAEP is doing this, we'd sometimes ask them questions about uh, that were pictorial or sometimes provide information that was video-based. Different ways of sort of ensure, not ensuring, but basically uh, providing relevant knowledge that might not be measured, but at least it would help to sort of even out these very extreme as, as uh, Andreas was putting it, we wanted to be unfair to all and make sure they had a baseline of understanding of things. And in our case, we really wanted to know what they knew ahead of time. So we knew how deeply or complexly they could reason with this based on the topical knowledge they already had. This is my final slide um, and thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, so we've got time for a few minutes specific to the national assessment panelists, and then we will transition um, forward to a, a wrap up and transition into a whole panel question. Um, so Mark, I had you up first with questions for the national panelists. So Mark, if you want to unmute, you've got it. Great. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate everybody's insight. It's been uh, very thoughtful and helpful to us. Um, my question is specifically around the context setting uh, uh, statements. I think, Rachel, you have in, in the Smarter Balance. Mark's question was so profound, he broke the internet. So we're going <laughs> to... I'm going to wait on Mark to unlag and catch up with us. If another board member has, oh, I see Mark moving. I'm back. Okay, go. Go. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, my question's for Rachel. Uh, do you have any videos, pictures for your context setting statements? No, we um, do not use any imagery or video on the assessment specific to those context um, setting statements. Um, we 
typically on our ELA literacy tend to limit the use of imagery uh, for our students and make sure that the content is appropriate um, in terms of the text that's provided. We have a lot of accessibility uh, resources and, and other kinds of ways to provide information to the student. Um, but uh, for some students who may be blind visually impaired or who may not be um, able to access those images, we, we typically focus on other ways to support the students. Thank you, Rachel. Um, the other questions that I have sitting in front of me, I really think would apply to a, a whole group panel discussion. Um, so I'm going to hold those. Uh, and we're going to transition to kind of a wrap up in a holistic question and answer time. Um, what we're going to do is Gina Cervetti is going to come back and give us kind of a wrap up board members as Gina is um, sharing her wrap up. If you've got questions for any panelists that we have heard today, um, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Right now, I've got Julia, Eric, and Suzanne queued up for questions. If anyone else has one, just drop it in the chat and I'll get you queued up. Um, but as we're doing that, Gina, with what we've heard from the five different assessment programs today, what are some possible implications for the future of NAEP reading framework and NAEP reading assessments? Thank you. So, so we know a lot about the role of knowledge in reading comprehension. We know that there are many kinds of knowledge that impact reading comprehension, including knowledge about texts and text genres, knowledge about how syntax works to communicate meaning and knowledge about the world. We also know that topic knowledge or knowledge of the topic of the particular text being read has a consistent and robust impact on reading comprehension. A large body of research has found that readers topic knowledge impacts reading comprehension across grade levels and across text types. There's, this research also explains that the most consistent impact of topic knowledge is on readers' ability to respond to question, questions that require bridging inferences or the formation of connections within texts and to more global inferences like, connect, like understanding concepts or themes. But topic knowledge also influences readers' ability to recall information from texts and answer text explicit questions. As such, we know that topic knowledge impacts many and probably all of the comprehension processes described in NAEP's comprehension targets. In light of this, the fact that readers' topic knowledge can vary so much from one text to another presents an important challenge for reading comprehension assessment. For example, one reader might have more knowledge of dinosaurs than baseball, right? Another reader reading Hana Hashimoto's Six Violin might know the meaning of the word talent and the meaning of the word show, but may not know the meaning of the phrase talent show having never experienced one at their school. Because reading comprehension assessments are based on texts that are necessarily about particular topics, the estimate of that reader's comprehension may reflect knowledge of those topics more than their comprehension ability. A second challenge for reading comprehension assessment is the fact that knowledge of particular topics can vary systematically according to group characteristics, like the state, region, community, or culture in which readers reside. Two examples. So given a text that relies on understanding that light and sound travel as waves, fourth graders in Arizona will have an advantage over fourth graders in Ohio. The concept of light and sound waves is introduced in grade three in Arizona, but not until middle school in Ohio. Similarly, if reading about text about quinceañeras, Latin American, students are likely to have an advantage over students with other cultural backgrounds. This means that differences in reading comprehension we detect between groups may be more related to topic knowledge than reading comprehension ability. In each of the assessment programs discussed today, attempts have been made to mitigate the impact of topic knowledge, especially where this knowledge might systematically advantage one group of interest over another. So for example, in the international assessments, topic knowledge that may be commonly known to students in one country, but not another. In all cases, these attempts to mitigate the impacts of topic knowledge are designed to produce better estimates of the kinds of reasoning that students can do with texts, which is typically the intended focus of comprehension assessment, the kinds of reasoning that are named and captured in the NAEP comprehension targets, for example. Attempts to mitigate the impact of topic knowledge are also grounded in the understanding that cold readings of texts about new topics reduce the ecological validity of the assessment or the authenticity of the assessment because readers rarely read about 
completely unfamiliar topics without supports in the world, in anywhere in the world outside of standardized tests. If a reader selects a text to read, it's generally because she knows something about the topic or at least knows enough to wanna to know more about the topic. When readers do read about unfamiliar topics at home or at school, adults or other resources like their cell phones are there to fill in significant gaps in knowledge. Across the assessment programs, many strategies have been discussed that are being used to mitigate the impact of specific and specialized topic knowledge. Text selection is consistently identified as one approach, but the specific strategies vary across assessments, right? So they include things like choosing texts that introduce unfamiliar information in ways that would be easily understood by readers who are new to that information, as in PEARLs, avoiding texts that rely on culturally specific information, as in PEARLs, or technical knowledge, as in Smarter Balanced, intentionally choosing texts on topics that will be familiar to students by aligning to curriculum, as in the Louisiana assessment, choosing sequenced and thematically related texts so that students are building knowledge as they read, as in GISA, choosing authentic and engaging assessments as in PISA and some of the other assessments. A second strategy focuses on the development of items, particularly working to develop items that are text dependent rather than knowledge dependent as in PEARLS and PISA, reviewing items for bias as in several of the assessments and avoiding evaluations of constructed response items based on background knowledge as in PEARLS. A third strategy is providing text introductions that include both topic information and purposes for reading as in PISA and GISA or footnotes as in Smarter Balanced. A fourth strategy is considering knowledge in the scoring and interpretation by measuring readers' knowledge and factoring that into the interpretation of assessments as in GISA. So included in this constellation of strategies are all of the strategies being pro proposed for NAEP 2026. So text selection involving elaboration, engagingness, and diversity of topics, knowledge UDEs involving introductions that include topic information and also offer purposes for reading and responding. So some of the strategies shared today are not available to NAEP. For example, um, assessing passages that are topically grounded in shared curriculum is a powerful strategy, but the US doesn't have national standards and NAEP is explicitly prohibited from making curriculum connections. So all of the features in the 2026 framework were also part of NAEP 2019, though the NAEP 2026 framework proposes slightly more robust approaches to contending with the inevitable differences in students' knowledge of the topics of the texts that are presented to them through more elaborate reading introductions of, to, for pivotal topic information. So NAEP cannot anticipate students' exposure to topic knowledge and experiences but it can provide a minimum amount of information so that fewer readers are derailed by completely unfamiliar topics. Clearly, there is no single way to address the role of topic knowledge and comprehension. The, the knowledge-oriented features that we're suggesting address knowledge in different but complementary ways, right? By increasing the likelihood that, um, some re that at least students will encounter at least some texts that they're familiar with by supporting readers' engagement, by focusing readers' attention on the most important information, and by providing introductions that address pivotal gaps in topic knowledge. So um, you might be wondering, I've said a couple of times that many kinds of knowledge impact reading comprehension. So why are we worrying so much about topic knowledge over other kinds of knowledge? So it is the case that many types of knowledge play important roles, things like right, textual knowledge or genre knowledge and linguistic knowledge of various kinds and topic knowledge and everyday world knowledge all play a role in reading comprehension. But these different types of knowledge have different relationships to reading comprehension. You can think of it as a continuum where on one end of the continuum are things like knowledge about text genres and knowledge about language structures, including things like syntax. These can be viewed as inherent to the domain of reading comprehension. They're part of the descriptors in the NAEP comprehension targets. They're part of the, AL, the achievement level descriptors, the ALDs in NAEP. And they're part of content standards in reading specifically. On the other end of the continuum is topic knowledge or knowledge of the topic of whatever text students encounter in the assessment. Topic knowledge is more inherent to content domains like science and social studies, music and health. Nowhere in the comprehension targets or ALDs does it say that NAEP assesses topic knowledge. 
In addition, topic knowledge is not addressed in content standards in reading. Thus, variation in topic knowledge can be thought of as construct irrelevant variants because they introduce variation that is not intended to be part of the construct being assessed. This has the potential not only to compromise validity, but also to systematically disadvantage some groups of students based on things like where they live and what cultural group, group they belong to. Having said this, topic knowledge will continue to influence scores. There is no UDE that can mitigate the outsized influence of topic knowledge on comprehension but attempts to mitigate its impact are key to creating a fairer and more valid assessment. Thank you. Gina, those were, that was incredible. Uh, I'm looking at my notes and I feel inadequate after you just wove all that together. Um, so we have, we are actually kind of ahead of schedule. So I want somebody to testify to my students that I can manage a clock because they don't believe it. Um, so we have time for some rich Q&A here. Uh, and so I'm just going to read off who I've got up first. And these can be to any panelists that you've heard today. Um, board, we don't really need to question each other because we've got time carved out tomorrow during our meeting for discussion of the reading framework. This is a chance for us to learn and dig in on the, the intersection of background knowledge and reading assessment. Um, so first up, I've got Julia. And then after that, I've got Rick. Thank you. Um, Gina, that was incredible. I, I am, um, I am a little bit at a loss for words. That was so incredibly helpful, and I so appreciate how thoughtful your points were on this. Um, I think where I'm just struggling a little bit candidly in this conversation, and I'm coming at it from both a parent perspective, but also just as a former teacher, are the kind of two things can be true at once. Sort of feeling about this conversation. I think that. Dan's points about background knowledge is not the problem to solve. It is what reading is, is really, really important. And at the same time, I feel like we're having what I'm experiencing is a little bit of a, a circular and kind of challenging conversation. When I think about the incredible work that Louisiana has done and Jenna, huge thank you to you and your team. I feel like you have just moved the country in terms of people's understanding about what's possible and really helping to drive real changes in teaching and learning. And you've done it in a way where you've really changed the way that teachers experience their craft. You've done it in a way where teachers now really see and believe and understand the importance of that knowledge that they are helping to build. And in so many ways, it, your tests are helping to design what we're really trying to solve for here. And I appreciate the points that we don't have a national curriculum. And I really appreciate your points on this, Gina. And at the same time, we know that these assessments do dictate the way things are taught. And I'm just really reluctant for us to be moving away from something where we are not explicitly focusing that the goal here is to help support a depth of background knowledge and that we want teachers to teach our students a depth of background knowledge. And I think the part that I'm just struggling on is, is what's going on in the chat, this conversation that we don't really know about the impact of putting um, you know, links into the questions. And, and Suzanne, I thought your points were great in there. And I just personally feel like I need to know more before this conversation can fully feel satisfied in us being able to move forward. And again, just would echo what the governor said in the chat, where are we trying to go to in this? Because it does feel like we're missing some important research and understanding in order to be able to move forward in, in, a, in a way on this, so. Any of our panelists want to reflect on what Julia just shared? I'd love to hear any insights as we're trying to grapple, she unpackaged some of what's been going on in the chat box. Uh, can I just can I just very quickly say, I couldn't agree more. In fact, all I do is go around the country and talk to teachers about knowledge enriching curriculum. So, but there's a difference between what we do instructionally to try to make sure that kids are equipped to read any text that's put before them. That is my goal. Um, and how we assess them and, and how we achieve fairness in assessment. So I agree with you on, on all of those points. And I still think that um, the ways that we contend with topic knowledge in the context of assessment is important and it is an issue of validity and fairness. I mean, I'll say one thing that 
I get the luxury of saying as a complete outsider to NAEP, although I understand very much the, the, the constraints and the, and the process. Uh, if you weren't measuring students only once with a drop out of the sky assessment, you'd have more opportunities to work these problems in a different way. So if you had the opportunity to say, provide information on one day or one session and spend some time with it, and then come back later at another day, you would, you would actually be addressing several uh, legitimate assessment uh, concerns of most of the people I know in the measurement community about only measuring once, about cold, completely cold breeds um, and other issues. Now you'd have all new problems to deal with, but, uh, but it, it, you know, we do have a digital world now. We have much more opportunities to get right there remotely. And we don't, we do, we do most of our reading in digital environments. So the, 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 the necessity of it being there in front of you at that moment as the way for us to nationally assess what we mean by reading is something that I think in the future we might want to reconsider. Sorry, that took us in a very different direction, but. Oh. All right, so that, my teacher wait time says that that was a chance for people to respond. So next up, Rick, and then Suzanne, you're up after Rick. Well, I should start and say that um, this is, we are dealing with the problem of knowledge, background, and so forth and reading comprehension, but the same applies to discussions of psychometrics and uh, the continuing discussions we're having here. So I will try to first bring up one question that I have as an outsider to this whole idea, but it's not the main thing I have. That Dan disagrees with Gina on, on many aspects. And the way I see it is that, um, Gina sort of thinks of the world as a linear world where you can pull out some background knowledge that might be biasing and be left with something that's worthwhile measuring. And Dan doesn't think the world's linear, that, that the background knowledge interacts with how you perceive text, how you translate it, how, what you get infer from it and so forth. So there's a, it seems like there's a fundamental um, conceptual difference between uh, these discussions and that's, that's lying over the top of it. But the, my real point is um, sort of starting with Greg's summary before that everybody in this room believes that background knowledge is going to be important. Um, but then there's the question of, of what you do with it and, and what is sort of legitimate to eliminate and what is not legitimate to eliminate. So if I, if I said, um, we know that uh, the average white student will perform better on the reading test than the average Native American. And I'm gonna adjust because the average Native American doesn't have the same background knowledge as the average white student. Um, there's a question about how much adjustment is legitimate and then what we're left with at the end. And, my, my real question that I bring to have people answer is that the problem is that we have no outside measure of legitimacy or fairness, if you wanna use that word. We have no outside way to judge what is legitimately scrubbed from our testing and what is illegitimately scrubbed that we want. So an, an economist might say, if you wanted an external measure that no, none of you will like this, but um, an economist might say that um, I want to uh, test the NAEP that will predict future performance outside of the eighth grade, whether they can perform well in college, whether they can perform well in the labor market. Some of that, the way they perform in college and the way they perform in a labor market might be biased. I mean, it might be biased towards certain kinds of things, but that's what uh, I would be interested in knowing. And I wouldn't want to get a scrub out things that predicted how well they do in the future. That's an external measure 
that I can use to then come back within uh, this process that Gina laid out so well of different ways to, to deal with bias at different points in the process and so forth. But then I have a way of judging it other than just to say it's different because it's different doesn't tell me which is the better way. So that, that's, that's the question if anybody wants to give their candidate for how we should judge legitimate versus illegitimate. So panelists, anybody want to tackle Rick's legitimate versus illegitimate question? And I'm going to go back on mute because I'm not a panelist. You have fun with that. Well, if I sort of just speak from 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 Pisa, I think you know, Rick, the issue is not to eliminate the uh, influence of background knowledge. We cannot, but I think what we should do is to eliminate bias at the group level, and uh, I think that's something we can do, and we can measure this effect. And I also think you know we can uh, probably better account for the effect of background knowledge, and as we should for you know motivation for self-efficacy. For me, background knowledge is just you know one of many constructs that we should somehow statistically account for its effect. But it's not about eliminating. Uh, once again, you know you want to assess authentic uh, reading situations. By the way, I think the, the the work that John Sabatini presented provides some really good examples how we actually can model some of those effects. And I think that's really the, 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 the answer to these issues. <clears throat> so could I just follow up, Andreas? I mean, um, we can study what leads to these differences. But so we see a group difference between, my example was we see it between the average Native American, the average white student. Is that bias or is that legitimate? I mean, we it's a group difference. And is it that I eliminate any bit of knowledge that one might know that the other doesn't? Or I mean, I don't, I still don't have a measure even of how I eliminate group differences. Well, you know, I think what you want to see is that effect. If if you have data that actually shows you that differences, I think you have done your job. You know, I don't think you need to design a task that doesn't, uh, you know, have those differences. But you would want to know where this difference comes from. Now, that's really, I think, the. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I might say that, you know, the, the PISA and, and PIAC are, are good examples of where the the, the data from the assessment and then the data from all the survey and outside questions is modeled, combined, used to predict economic indicators and look for these kinds of differences that make a difference. And so you, I don't think the goal here is to reduce, as, as Andreas and others said, it's not to reduce the differences among these different groups so much as to make sure we understand the source of those differences. And if the source of those differences is, as Gina put it, uh, differences in topical knowledge, that's still an issue that might be addressed educationally, environmentally, et cetera. It's not like we're, we're saying that that's okay and then we're getting rid of it. We're saying, no, different students seem to have different knowledge about different things and that might matter to them later on. And so at least it's, at least it's measured and upfront and part of the discussion not buried in a sampling model that doesn't tell you whether those differences exist. And I would just offer that if we're if we're thinking about the items themselves, the tests themselves, I think it's important to acknowledge who the we is that is making the decisions about whether the items are appropriate or within the bounds of what we would expect students to be familiar with. And in and, and Smarter Balance, we really rely on educators to, to, to tell us that, to, to make that determination. And so being mindful that um, the, the people who know the students the best should be involved in, in some of those decisions around specifics, around how much context, you know, which specific topic would be included and then ongoing monitoring as we're talking about with statistics after student performance is gathered the educators might not be very good at identifying which people are going to do well in the labor market later on they might be very good at, at identifying um, which students will do best on the tests that we normally give but this is partly an underlying question of what 
the objective of the exercise is and what you're looking for. Right. So I think our objective is to assess reading. There are probably lots of things that are going to predict how well, you know, s students do in other kinds of contexts. But, but as, fa as far as what we can assess that is authentic to the construct of reading that is probably consequential for students, we're saying it's the things that are embedded in the comprehension targets and in the achievement level descriptors that are part of what NAEP says it's assessing. And topic knowledge is not what NAEP says it's assessing. Topic knowledge may also be consequential for students in terms of success in other kinds of contexts. But the question is, is it appropriate to, to embed that in the measurement of reading? I muted myself. Um, next question is Suzanne. And I know we can keep going on that topic forever, but I wanna make sure I hit as many board members as possible. So Suzanne, you had a question. Thank you, Patrick. I've really enjoyed the presentations and the discussion has been um, very informative. I, I, and I, I appreciate the need to think about universal design procedures for any assessment um, to help ensure that we have valid and fair score interpretations and uses. My concern is that I, I don't know the literature with respect to the extent to which these features, such as pop-ups, videos, um, introductions even, um, are sources of construct or relevant variants. And it, these types of features might act, may impede performance for some students. Thinking, and I'm not an expert in this area, but poor readers, if they're asked to read more, is that going to actually disengage them? So I, I appreciate the fact that topic knowledge and background knowledge might be a source of construct of relevant variance, but I also wonder where is the evidence to ensure that these features are not sources of construct or relevant variance and are not impeding some students' performances and some subgroups of students' performances. So, um, so I'll let others speak to this, but I'll just say quickly that we do have a study, a special study done with 3,000 students who took the 2019 version of the NAEP that had these support features in addition to other support features. And, um, and the result was it basically that, um, that the passages that had these support features were, were um, the scores were higher on the items associated with the passages that had these support features, but it didn't differentially advantage any particular group of students. So they identified groups in the NAEP. Thank you. I, I, I read a little bit about that study. It would be, I guess, useful to know um, in terms of the score scale, were um, lower able students just, were they um, using these features and um, they were not impeding their performance? Well, their performance was not suppressed. It, it, so it, so it, they, it was, it was, there was an equal advantage across low achieving and high achieving students, but I don't know, I don't have the details. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll, I'll add to that, that that's where the, the sort of metacognition and reading strategies uh, uh, elements that uh, were discussed earlier might end up interacting in a uh, educationally useful way. Um, good readers know to use certain strategies and certain kinds of tools and certain elements. And so it, it's generally part of my understanding of good instruction in reading development that that be provided to students in one form or another in a specific way. So the, the absence of using those opportunities when given to you is itself an important part of measuring the construct in a way. That's why we call them moderators. If you can do it without those, that's, that's proficient performance. That's why we didn't call it the construct. But if those are made available to you and you fail to use them, that's also not taking advantage of the environment of reading that is there to help you to become a better reader. 
And so that's also useful evidence to acquire in an assessment uh, that's, help, that's helping us govern the education system we want. So to John's point, we've got 10 minutes remaining and four questions in the queue. I just have to add commentary right there that what John just said made me think of NAEP's process data that we get from tests in a whole new light. Um, and that could be a way to get around some of these hyperlink issues that we keep talking about. Um, but Paul, you're up next and then Dana. I'll try to be as quick as possible. And I apologize in advance for my inarticulate bumbling I'm going to try to go through with this question. Patrick, you've done a great job. But I want to go into the way back machine as far as this presentation goes. And Andreas, uh, Gina, actually, uh, something you said provoked me to, to rethink about this. But Andreas, when you talked about preferred item analysis and you showed that slide and that suggested that the results of the PISA assessments would not change markedly if countries had more influence in selecting tests that they thought might be fairer to their students. I thought that that had some real implications for our conversation here. And Gina, then when you mentioned Arizona and Ohio and the differences there, and then talked about the topic knowledge mitigation I don't know how all of those things fit together, but it seems to me that there's some rich that they could inform some of the things we're going through. And I just throw it to Andreas and Gina on that one. I think you muted Andreas. Sorry, Paul. Um, that chart that you saw is, of course, after we eliminate tasks that have very strong item country interactions. But what it really shows you is that you can achieve a kind of equally unfair set of tasks across very different cultural, linguistic, and uh, national contexts. I think that's really what we can demonstrate. And once again, our objective is not to eliminate those influences, but to somehow account for them and to make them visible. Now, that's really, I think, the the point and um, <clears throat> in this, and I, I, someone mentioned before the process data. I also believe that is a lot. A lot of the future of of our work lies in having you know better handle on understanding those process data, so that you can actually understand when students get sidetracked and so on. I think we are just at the very beginning of scratching the surface, but I think what you're doing in NAEP, what we are doing in PISA, I think is really pointing the way to the future of understanding how students respond and what factors actually shape their influences. Thank you very much. I like the idea of equally unfair. <laughs> Dana, you're up. And after Dana is Marty. So just um, basically a comment that can go to anybody. Earlier today, we had um, Dr. Hughes talk to us about the five E's of equitable educational assessments empathy, engagement, equity, evaluation, and equality. And she also talked about some of the inferences of students who don't um, score well. The individuals in this group have a low level of understanding of the passages. The individuals in this group have difficulty in understanding the contents of Reader's Digest, because that's where it was coming from. The individuals in this group are in general poor readers, and the individuals in this group are not likely to do well in college. So to my panelists is um, when we're talking about background knowledge and we are trying to stop these inferences that are happening, especially to our children of color, um, when we use words of distractors or things of that nature, what is it that we as the National Assessment Governing Board, what are your words to us um, to be able to look like so that we can stop these um, inferences that are being made, being made about our students, but also level the playing field of equity and equality to our nation's students. Anybody there? Or did I just drop the mic? <laughs> I think you did drop the mic. Um I, I feel unprepared. I, I wasn't present for the earlier conversation, so I feel a little bit cast adrift um, with respect to the question. Um, but certainly both in the things that we're talking about today related to knowledge and also in some of the other moves that have been recommended in the draft framework, we issues of equity are, are certainly a, 
an, uh, one of the guiding principles. But again, I'm not familiar with, I don't know the framework that was just. I'll just speak a little, Dana, about our work here in Louisiana, and that that is one of the, the drivers of this innovative assessment pilot. When we lo look across our state um, and we look at our, our traditional state assessment, our LEAF data, um, and we can see the disproportionality um, of the scores and student achievement there. And so, yes, we have um, really high percentages of our students of color who struggle to um, achieve at a level of mastery on our state assessments. And so when looking across, that was something that I think initially drove this work for this innovative assessment pilot in the consideration of background knowledge. And so I think that is a lot of what's driving this innovative assessment pilot. And again, what is making us really encouraged by some of the initial data that we're seeing around how students are much more engaged. And when I think about it from a student perspective, as I often like to do, I think about encountering these cold read texts, um, especially if I encounter them as a struggling reader and I put myself in them, their shoes. And I think about encountering text that is on grade level when I might not be reading on grade level. And beyond that, um, seeing words and context that I am completely unfamiliar with, um, topics that I don't know how to approach. And so what we are seeing and hearing from students with our innovative assessment pilot is that because they have that exposure to the topics um, and they are bringing that with them when they take the assessment, there is already a level of comfort. Um, and I think about how a lot of students, our struggling readers will shut down on <laughs> these high stakes assessments. Um, and so what we're hearing from our students taking this innovative assessment pilot is that already just seeing text that they are already comfortable with or seeing topics that they already have some knowledge of just makes them feel really empowered to even try their best at taking the assessment, even if the texts are on grade level and they are not reading on grade level. And so um, in putting myself in the shoes of the students who actually sit and take these assessments, that just drives a lot of our work around this innovative assessment pilot and makes us really hopeful about where we can take this from an equity standpoint. Thank you. All right, we're gonna um, hit Marty and then Greg, our last two questions. So Marty, go ahead. Great, I have two quick questions, one for Gina and one for Dan. Uh, I think all of us are acutely aware of the equity implications of um, you know, this topic and uh, really wanna make sure that the assessment is not uh, in how it treats background knowledge um, discriminating against any particular group. Uh, and Gina, you referred to some ways in which that could be the case in your concluding summary, uh, when groups have differential access by virtue of their uh, cultural or life experiences to knowledge that would be included. And then Andreas also said, one of the things we want to scrub is, is large group differences. Um, my understanding though, is that we have a tool for that in the development of items, which is uh, analysis of differential item functioning, right? Where we look to see whether there are items on the assessment on which a particular group of students does uh, better or, or less well than they would given their performance on the rest of the assessment. So I guess um, my question, Gina, is um, how does this use of differential item functioning fit into that concern about group differences and, and why is it not enough of a tool on its own. And then the question for, for Dan, um, Gina seems to make a really good point in that uh, topic knowledge is not explicitly mentioned in the NAEP reading framework, what it is we say that we're assessing. So given your understanding of the field, you know, would your preferred solution be to revise the framework such that the, the definition of reading includes mastery of a diverse array of content knowledge. So I think what, I, what I'll say is that I think that the use of, you know, analyses of differential item functioning are really important, but I also think we can design for equity as well. 
you know, we can we can analyze for equity, but we can also design for equity, and we have some some strong tools presented here today to do so. And what we're suggesting is actually a fairly modest attempt to do that at the design phase, so that when we get to the assessment of differential item functioning, we're likely to see less of a problem. Uh, yeah, and Marty, in response to your question, um, yeah, I think the, the NAEP reading framework as it stands, if that's what it says, it's not really realistic about what reading is. And exactly how you would want to handle that is, of course, would need to be a topic of discussion. As things stand, what the way it, the test works, in fact, is it prioritizes broad but relatively shallow knowledge. Um, and that's probably inevitable. Um, and acknowledging that it would probably be sensible. In the interest of time, Greg, you're up. Yeah, so really, uh, just to recap, something I put in the chat because I didn't uh, know if it would uh, be time for it. But um, you know, um, John's comments really helped me understand I, what I think is the the, the, the separating uh, issue, the defining issue, which is, um, do we want to sort of control for background knowledge and reporting a reading score, or do we want to help explain reading performance because of background knowledge? Um, this is the question that, you know, those of us in the assessment world face all the time. Um, if a student gets a low NAEP reading score, we darn well better be able to stand behind it as a board and say it's because the kid's not got great reading skills, you know, because they're a poor reader. But the question then is why? The follow-up why question, did they get that low reading score? It's always what everybody wants to know. Was it because of instructional um, problems? Was it because of processing problems? Was it because of background knowledge? I mean, I think that's this distinction that that's, was at least crystallized for me in John's comments really uh, brings it to a sharper point. So thank you. All right, that that was a little quicker than I thought. So Reginald had actually pinged me in the um, chat box. So Reginald, let me turn it over to you and then I will close us up. Cricket, thank you, Patrick. I just have a comment just around. So of course, you know, I come from a different background. I'm an industry person. And in my in our circles, we always talk about how well the United States does a good job assessing how kids do school. But as an engineer, though, we have sometimes have issues take place in the field and we get technical reports. And what we found was, and, and these technical reports actually come to us as engineers, so we all are knowledgeable of the incident that took place in the field. But based on the writer or the author of the technical report, Sometimes we cannot comprehend what they're trying to tell us to do. So we implemented a, for all authors, you must put an appendix in the technical report because we knowledgeable other information, but we have no idea. We cannot comprehend what the report is telling us. And it kind of goes back to what Dan was talking about. It kind of depends on how the person is writing it and what they leave out, what they don't put in. And then from a global perspective, we had an incident that took place across uh, both our country and the, U and the UK, technical report comes in from a US engineer, what we should do to correct that issue. We left the meeting thinking, got emails from the UK engineering group, didn't understand what was going on. And of course in the US, we were like, man, of course that's because we just smarter than those guys. Then later on, we got a report coming in from a UK engineer, some things we need to fix in our engine over here in the US. And we sent an email back and said, hey guys, we don't think we can implement that because it does not make sense to us. They sent an email back to us stating that they had implemented this, that issue and that they had uh, received accolades for implementing such a great idea. And it kind of helped us understand that it's knowledge, of course, but comprehension is, in, in our world, comprehension is based on knowledge. And if we really assess some kids, Rick, to your point, what are kids able to do once they leave school? If you don't have the knowledge, I need you to be able to comprehend something. If you don't know, if you have the knowledge, great. If you don't have the knowledge, get the knowledge so that you can comprehend and continue to do the things you need to do to be a success in whatever industry you pursue. Just a quick, quick comment. Thank you. My comment on that? Uh, yeah, you raised your hand. That's the first hand raise I've seen in 12 months. So yes, <laughs> I'm gonna go with that. Well, I think it also brings up the importance of communication, which to me in some ways is not actually covered in the framework properly because we don't just read static materials anymore. We read a, 
what each other writes. We communicate about it. We share that knowledge and we come to different understanding. One of the way to mediate Dan's kind of issues about knowledge is when do we, when do we share knowledge in a way that we can now understand each other? And I think that's a legitimate 21st century need. And I think it also bridges towards this application of reading outside of school because in so many of these circumstances, it's people trying to understand each other, communicating through writing. And actually that's what writ written documents are in some ways is people communicating through writing just without the interaction. But nowadays interaction is pretty much the rule, not the, the I mean, r news reports I read yesterday get updated today. I mean, and then they get updated in response to people writing about them. And I know the new PISA uh, framework, for example, takes into consideration this idea that one would have multiple authors communicating in a real-time basis. So I, I think that maybe 2030, the framework will think of reading as also partially communication, and maybe that'll start to bridge to this outside world. Well, on, on that note, we have reached the end of our symposium. I am gonna need a long time to process all of this. Um, first and foremost, thank you to our panelists. What incredible information and insights um, and learning that we've been provided. Uh, my hope is that everyone participating today has found this symposium as useful as I have. Um, this afternoon's conversations have touched on two of the most complex issues in education, reading and assessment. And as noted in the revised reading framework, reading is a quote, complex cognitive process, making this an especially challenging topic for standardized assessment as students use unique and individualized pathways to achieve reading comprehension. And one of the core reasons for this complexity is the, the role of background knowledge. And so I'm glad that we've been able to deep dive on this today as a board. Um, you know, for example, if I had handed students in my class a reading passage about how to make a TikTok, they would have been really confused if that passage had then been written by a government employee, because the term TikTok has a fundamentally different connotation in their world than the video that my students think that it is. And by the way, we have hit the TikTok in terms of being on time today. So I'm excited about that. Uh, so for these reasons, the capacity of NAEP to provide, quote, important measurable indicators of student achievement requires careful consideration of the role of background knowledge in reading comprehension. Um, so for the board members, this is just a part of the conversation tomorrow around reading framework. This is our background knowledge, if you will, before we have a further conversation around the reading framework revision tomorrow. Um, but it's one piece of the equation. There's a couple other issues as well. So um, reflect on this before our conversation tomorrow. Um, in addition to thanking our panelists, I wanna thank um, the board staff who put together this symposium as well as the prior one. That's a lot of work to pull together this kind of learning environment um, digitally over Zoom. So to the Hatcher staff, to the NAGB staff, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I wanna extend thanks to everyone from the public who listened in. We were over 300 participants at one point. Um, if you're with the media and you have any questions, please contact Stefan Harris at S-T-E-P-H-A-A-N dot h-a-r-r-i-s at ed.gov. Um, this session concludes today's board meeting. Um, Governor, Governor Barbara had to um, step out, so we're going to wrap with this. Um, board members, we have a full session tomorrow devoted just to this topic, but we also have other important business as well, starting at 12 o'clock in closed session using that really nice document Leslie gave us with all the hyperlinks. Um, so, Leslie, anything else before we wrap? If you all would like to have a virtual drink, board members, where that head over to the social hour. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow at uh, 12 o'clock um, in closed session. We mean in closed session tomorrow for the first hour or two hours of the meeting. So, thanks, everyone. Great job, Patrick. Nice work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.